So the first scripture reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with God, my God. Now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One. To one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the slave of rulers, kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves, because the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, has chosen you. The New Testament lesson is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked up at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. Here ends the reading. So this, this season in the church calendar between Christmas and Lent is often as a whole considered the season of Epiphany Tide. And like the Feast of Epiphany, the scripture lessons the church uh, calendar focuses on are about who Jesus is and by extension, what people should do about knowing who Jesus is. Now the gospel lesson from John is all about Jesus' identity and it has four different names for Jesus. Lamb of God, Son of God, Rabbi, and Messiah and Messiah in Greek is Christ. So when we say Jesus is Christ, we're saying he's Jesus the Messiah. So it's a statement about who Jesus is. Now, early Christians in this time period, when in the time period when the New Testament was being written, looked to the Old Testament. The, that was the only scripture they had. And they looked to the Old Testament to find language for who Jesus is and to understand his identity. And the lesson from the prophet Isaiah is one that these Christians looked to. Now this section of Isaiah is part of a, a larger section of the book called the Servant Songs because they are all in verse and deal with an unnamed servant who is commissioned by God. And one of the classic debates among rabbis and scholars is figuring out who the servant is. Now a, a common Jewish interpretation is to say the servant being talked about is Israel and therefore the songs are about Israel's role as a whole. 
Another major campus to say the servant is the prophet Isaiah. And then Christians reading this can't help but point out that this sounds a lot like Jesus. So who is this servant? Who is this really about? I was talking with a friend, and she was telling me how things were, me and others, how things were going with uh, being a mom of a toddler. And she mentioned that she's been watching a lot of kids' TV. But actually, she said, some of it's really good. She's like, this one show has some really great songs about important things. Like, there's this song about how sometimes we feel two feelings at the same time, and it's okay. And, you know, that's a good reminder. Sometimes we do feel two feelings at the same time. And if we jump back to Isaiah, the identity and uh, the identity of the servant, I think this is a situation where scripture means two or more things at the same time, just like we can feel two feelings at the same time. And that's all okay. And all of the options for the servant's identity have truth to be found in them. So whoever we want to say the servant in Isaiah is, he seems to be facing a situation many of us have likely faced at some point. He's worked and tried, but he doesn't see the impact of all of his efforts. He feels discouraged and like his labor's been in vain. He's sacrificed for God and done the right thing, but that doesn't seem to have made any difference. One of the hard things about life is we sometimes can do the right thing and work for something good, and it doesn't seem like all that effort accomplished anything at all. And I find it somewhat encouraging that people in the Bible experience these same feelings of discouragement, even when it seems like God was a lot more talkative with many of them than at least God is with me. And it's one of the ways scripture kind of reflects real life. Sometimes we just can't know how we've made a difference. We plant seeds in a garden we often don't get to see grow. And it's natural to sometimes get discouraged about not seeing the fruit of our labors. So the servant's feeling discouraged, and God decides to give him a pep talk. And as encouragement, the servant is reminded of his identity as someone precious to God, and he's reminded of his mission, and he's given assurance that in the end, his mission will be accomplished. I want to focus on on that mission that the servant's given. Now, at first, his mission is about restoring Israel. It's about bringing the exiled and defeated people out of Babylon and restoring to them, them to their land and restoring the nation of Israel. Now that's a hard task on its own, but then God adds, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. Essentially, God is saying restoring Israel from exile is too small a task. It's really just phase one of the plan. God's plan involves the servant's work restoring the whole world. The servant is given as a light to the nations, a light to all people. And as you might guess, this is one of the verses that really resonated with Christians as something describing Jesus. Now, what's interesting about describing Jesus as a light is lights aren't functionally important in and of themselves. They're they're important because they illumine things. Lights show us the way. They allow us to see things that were hidden before. Now, in the original context of Isaiah, it seems that the idea was that a restored Israel would illumine the way for the other nations of the world. And Israel would be a light not through glory and success, but because it had shown the fullness, the faith because it had shown faithfulness to God throughout periodic hardship. Israel would shine because it would show the glory and knowledge of God to all people, despite all the trials they'd been through. People would see the way brightened by Israel's example and come to true knowledge of God. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount sees the role of the church being similar to that. He says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Essentially, the church is meant to shine as an example, to light the way people should go. In John Winthrop's famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, from the beginning of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, he preaches that the mission of the colony and the people as Christians was to be an example to the rest of the nations of the world about how the church should be. He says, Men shall say of succeeding plantations, The Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people shall be upon us. 
Being God's people involves living faithfully in such a way that it shines as an example to others. Let's jump back to the lesson from John. This shows Jesus calling the first disciples, and unlike the other three Gospels, there's no scene with the disciples fishing. Instead, we've got disciples who come to Jesus after having been John the Baptist's first disciples. And John the Baptist's role is to point the way to Christ, and he quite literally points out Jesus to people by saying, look, there he goes, there's the Lamb of God. So two of John's disciples start following Jesus, like they literally just start following him as he's walking by. And then, eventually, Jesus turns around and asks them, what are you looking for? Now, this is the first thing Jesus says in John. Up until this point, Jesus has only been talked about, but here he speaks. And unlike the rest of the gospel according to John, Jesus here says something very simple. What are you looking for? And it's a, it's a question meant for us today as well. If we were each to answer that question, what are you looking for? I think we'd all come up with some different answers. And sometimes what we're looking for from Jesus changes over time. But it's really noteworthy that Jesus starts off his ministry not with telling people what to do or what to think. He starts off with a question. Jesus wants to be in conversation, in relationship with people. Now, it seems the disciples don't really have exactly what they want from Jesus figured out, but they do feel that there's something about Jesus that makes them want to spend more time with him. So they ask, teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus responds with, come and see. It's an invitation to be with Jesus, to go where the light is illuminating a new way. Now, this new way Jesus is showing is directly related to how salvation and sin are understood in John. Now, like the, the Spark Notes version of what Jesus did by dying on the cross is that he, he died to save us from our sins. Now, when I hear the word sin, the first thing I think of is stuff I've done wrong. It's the times I haven't followed God's law or done what I'm supposed to do. And the Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have lots of material on this sort of understanding of sin. But John comes at sin from a different angle. Sin in John isn't a moral category of bad things. Sin is not being in relationship with God. It's being separated from God. Now, bad stuff we do harms our relationship with God and our relationship with others. So this definition of sin doesn't mean we get a free pass on following the commandments. But thinking of sin as separation from God is a really helpful way to look at how Jesus saves us. If the biggest problem is people are separated from God, if the biggest problem is people are not in relationship with God, then it seems like the best thing to do would be for God to show up and be with people. And that's precisely what Jesus does. He's born a human being and lives among us. He builds relationships with people. Jesus takes away the sin of the world because he shows up and enters into a closer relationship with humanity than God has ever done before. The life, death, and resurrection of Christ invites us into the intimate parent-child relationship that the Son shares with the Father. We're saved through the ongoing relationship with God that Christ makes possible. And the cross shows us that the relationship is stronger than even death. We're delivered from sin because God is always with us and in relationship with us, and God even now dwells in every single one of us through the Holy Spirit. And this is a really helpful reminder because sometimes I can get bogged down in thinking about the life of faith as a bunch of stuff I'm supposed to be doing. You're supposed to fight for the oppressed, feed the hungry, promote justice, love your neighbor, volunteer at church, pay your pledge, and so on. And for me, at least, it can sometimes feel what Christianity is asking of me is just to do a really bunch of hard stuff, and it can get exhausting because there's so much to do, and it's difficult. But John's Gospel helps with that because it's a reminder that it's our relationship with God that sustains us and empowers us to live lives of faith. It's through God being with us that we can see where we should go. Jesus and being in relationship with him does involve doing hard things. Other people as loves us is extremely difficult. 
the story throughout all of scripture is how people are able to do hard things through faith in God and through the help of other people. We build our faith both by standing up for what's right, doing good works, and through prayer and making time to read scripture and connect with God. When we do that, the light of the Christ, the light of the nation shines forth throughout the world through all of us. And the good news about light is it just takes a little bit of light to drive out the darkness and make the world just a little bit brighter. Amen.